Welcome back. Here we are. Guess who's back? We're back in, again. We're in the same old clothes. Same old clothes. From Wednesday, at least. I was <laughs> the uh, episode where we were talking about labels. Yes. I realized that I was showing clips from our music video shoot, and I was wearing the same hoodie. <laughs> so there's a little Easter egg if you didn't catch it. I don't own a whole lot of clothes. I mean, like I d- I get get comments on uh, some of my videos. Or like, oh, black shirt, how original! Like, I literally own like ten black shirts, and that's it. Listen, we're not pulling a straight up Steve Jobs. We're not wearing the same black shirt all the time. <laughs> now, I will say <laughs> that I've bought. I think five of the exact same pair of, or exact same black V-neck shirt because it fit well. Oh, yeah. And I don't know if if you can relate. I'm sure there's a lot of you that can relate. I don't own a lot of clothes because, one, I don't like spending money on clothes when I could be spending money on gear. And, two, I don't have an easy time finding things that feel comfortable and Mm. fit well. Like, I have weird body measurements. I have kind of a long torso and even longer legs. And so... A See, large feels okay around here, but then it's too short. I have the same problem. I can go get an extra large, which is what I would typically wear, but they're way too short because I have a dumb long torso and then tiny little legs, <laughs> which buying pants is a fun experience <laughs> your boy's short. But if I bought like 10 of these built Shirts, yeah, and they're drop cut, and now my butt doesn't hang out. I like so. built stuff. A drop cut shirts should be the like norm. Yes, please. They need to be the norm. Unless and you I, have a really short torso, I guess. Then it becomes that's true. It becomes that'd a dress. be too much. But I challenge any of you go try to find a thirty three by thirty six pant anywhere. If 36? you find one, let me know. Uh, thirty three by thirty six. I'm struggling at like a thirty eight twenty nine. Yeah, I feel like <laughs> we, legs. we're covering those spectrums. Like it's it's tough. I wish I could just get like a what what's a common one a thirty four thirty four or something and be happy because those are everywhere. They're yeah. just falling off the shelves. You walk down the aisle and you know Coles or whatever, and they're just littered in the streets. <laughs> I can't find a good set. You know where I can find it though? Express. Express jeans, that's what I'm wearing right now. They've got those stretchy fits. Well, I understand. They have sales a lot, though. And I I am not a strong shopper. I'm calling you bougie, and I bought built shirts. <laughs> I, I'm not a strong shopper. I don't have the patience for it. Um, but Kara, she is so sweet, and she is great at shopping. And so she'll make a trip every once in a while and come home with just a bag of clothes. And that's how I get new clothes. If you see me wearing something new, 99.9% of the time, it's because Kara went out and bought it for me. That's awesome. Yeah, it's great. Now I just need somebody to, I don't know, pick my clothes out for me every day. Because this is how we got started on it, right? You and I, we don't have many clothes. And people say, like, you're wearing the same thing. I had the same hoodie from the video shoot and then the podcasting day. Listen, it's all black. It's hard to remember what I wore and didn't wear. And I... I go to the gym a lot, so I have to do laundry a lot, and I don't fold my laundry all the time. It yeah. sits in the basket, so I just grab what's in the basket. So stop picking on us, Steven. I knew it was you, Steven. You left that anonymous note being rude, bullying. Bullying, which, I, you know, we have fun with each other, Jeremy, <laughs> but we don't outright bully each other because we don't stand for that kind of behavior. And we don't stand for it on our new Discord channel. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to make that transition work. <laughs> Keep going. This is okay. Good. All right. This is good. So um, we heard some people talking about how, man, this is such a cool community that's starting to grow. We think it is too. And uh, some people had said, wouldn't it be so neat if there was a Discord where we could just kind of talk more about these things that we're bringing up on the podcast, hear other opinions, have some real conversations and maybe some other things. Um, So I guess starting with this one, there'll be a link down there. You can go join. You can maybe invite some friends that are also into music, but maybe don't necessarily know the podcast or even listen to podcasts. That's cool. That's whatever. Um, 
it's a new venture for both of us. I've used Discord with gaming friends, but that's a whole a whole different atmosphere, you know. So I've used it with Mid Journey and like beta product releases. So I'm interested to learn the community, but new new thing for me. Yeah. So if there are some things you'd like to see, some ideas that you know we can all start building together, just let us know. Um, there's going to be that general thread for everybody to just be talking with each other, bringing up their, you know different ideas, what they're into. But um, I would personally love to see a thread dedicated to different setups, whether it's studio, live music rigs, anything like that, Um, and anything and everything else. So let us know what you think. Uh, Hit the link down there. Join the Discord. Join the community. It's just starting up. So, um, you know, there's a lot of freedom here for us to form it into whatever works best for everybody. Yeah. But no bullying. That's how we got here. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of how to transition into what we're going to talk about. I got nothing. You got nothing. That's okay. We can do a hard transition. Mm. <laughs> we need to do like the, the TikTok thing where you like move the camera and then you move it back and it's like a movement transition. Just get a, you get a whip pan transition. Done. Here, Already did it. <laughs> do it again. Wa-ba-ba. Now there's now, fire. Ba-ba-ba. Oh, fire. <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna be fun for you later. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, what did we? Did the podcast already come out? Where at the end of it, we were like, "This is probably a, a topic for another discussion." Yep, that was two weeks ago, and okay. now it's time for that discussion. Is it, okay, is it actually two weeks ago? Or from when this? From, from this? From this? So this weeks. is really in the future. We're time traveling. We're time. We are time travelers. Actually, all of us are time travelers. You know, if you can experience time, you are currently traveling through time. You know, everyone's also a 3D printer. You told me that. <laughs> everyone. Think about it. You'll figure it out eventually, but everyone is a 3D printer. <laughs> anyway. So. It's a poop joke. <laughs> Fire. <laughs> I'm going to drop so many weird graphics that you're going to have to do. Or if there's not a graphic, I'm just going to look like an idiot. Fire. <laughs> um, so two weeks ago. End of that podcast, I said something like, I had a theory on if, like, certain business practices are actually good for your local economy. Was Mm -hmm. it something like that? Yeah. Okay. Along those lines. So, I definitely have thoughts about this, and I don't think they're the only thoughts. But it's not necessarily going after this one particular practice of business. I don't want it to seem like that. And I don't want it to seem like... Just how you structure your business makes you bad or not bad. Like, that shouldn't be tied to it. This is more how you're viewing business as a whole and how that affects your local economy, I suppose. Okay. Is that fair? I think think that's a good, like, preamble to this discussion. So the main thought was, and this, this comes from a place of owning a business and having a business. And I mean, there's a lot of customers that you'll encounter that appreciate what you're doing. And um, there's also a fair amount of customers, or I guess they wouldn't be customers at that point, who will basically attack you uh, on the basis that why are you charging for this? Right. Um, As if either you're not professional or, I mean, we're not in Nashville. So sometimes what I hear is, well, you're not a Nashville studio. Why are you charging for this that sounds like a very educated customer yeah the other part of this and there is no shade against churches i go to a church i work in a few churches i produce a whole lot of christian music but there's a fair amount of churches church clients that i have had who have been the ones who later after the fact want to discuss price and how they shouldn't have to pay and i Mm -hmm. The, this whole thing wraps back around to the mindset of money and how it can affect like your local economy and your local music scene. Because at the heart of it, everything has to be sustainable, right? Like if you're looking at this from like a band perspective or a player perspective, you make your living mm-hmm. around everything else functioning. Yeah. If a venue is not working the way it should, it's not going to bring in a crowd. It's not going to be able to charge prices to be able to pay bands. 
Now, you may not like how much that venue charges. You may not like certain things about that. But overall, if all these things are working together, everyone has to be making money for the scene as a whole to be healthy. Mm -hmm. The other side of this is when if you feel also like it can come around to a place where you get guilty to make a profit at this. And Mm -hmm. if you're looking at this from any perspective of of having a career in music or anything, there has to be a level of sustainability. And that's different and highly subjective Mm -hmm. for everyone. And that shouldn't be defined by anyone but you as to what your success looks like. There's hyper exaggerations on either side. There's greed and then there's poverty, right? (laughs) But there has to be like a Goldilocks zone. And for you to be healthy as a business, whether that's a recording studio, a band, a player, Mm -hmm. like one, knowing your worth, knowing your worth in the marketplace, because those can be two different things sometimes. And how do those things play together? Now, my contention comes with there, there was a business that opened fairly close to us that was uh, oh, actually a few of them at this point, not not for profit studios, mm-hmm. and they got a whole lot of buzz right off the bat, um, because oh look, there's somebody who, you know, wants to do this music and help or help the scene, and they're not concerned with making money. That's cool. I think the contention here is even a not for profit has to make a profit. Right. At the end of it, at the end of the day, it's not necessarily that a business is or is not going to make profit. It's a like how you're defining that profit and how that applies to tax. So you, you, a quick interjection. You see this a lot with uh, different charities. Yeah. And you can go down that rabbit hole if you don't want to feel very good anymore, if you so choose. But just bring that part up. <laughs> there's a lot of there's a dark, a lot of dark sides too not-for-profits, and there's a lot of very positive sides. Just like labels, like we talked about a couple weeks ago. (laughs) The world ain't so black and white, is it? (laughs) Lots of gray out there. So much gray. (laughs) And and again, I don't think this has to do with the fact that, oh, a studio opened up that's not-for-profit, so they're going to be bad for the industry as a whole. That's not it. It's more like almost this mindset of martyrdom maybe Mm -hmm. like hey we're here to help you well a for-profit business can do that and sometimes more effectively yeah um and i mean something that might surprise you is even a for-profit business um myself or any other studio around here the person who gets paid last is the owner (laughs) I mean, and that person might be paid handsomely or not so handsomely Mm -hmm. because the business as a whole has to make a profit, right? For a not-for-profit, you could work in the salary at any stage yeah. because the the way the tax – you're just defining that profit differently. So you could work a salary in that's highly exorbitant um, to the point where that person's making far more than competition, but their business isn't healthy. Right. Now, they still have to make a profit, but I think it's it's so much more with, like, when people don't want you to make money for a service you're providing them. Yeah, and I think that's where the, the idea comes into play of how is this affecting your local scene, right? Mm-hmm. In terms of, it, I think it is uh, setting that, it could it could set that as a norm for a lot of the aspiring people in the industry in that scene. Um, at least from my perspective, like it, let's use the church as an example again because you you brought that up and um, I've played in churches since I started playing professionally. They can be great gigs. Yeah, and honestly, a lot of my early kind of live performances outside of jazz were church gigs that really helped me learn a lot about um, fitting in tonally in that kind of style, which helps a lot in the studio realm, especially if you're at a church that uses Mm in-ears and you have these kind of tonal shapes and and, um, kind of roles that synonymously work really well in a a lot of recording sessions. Mm -hmm. 
So I have nothing against that at all. And I'm super appreciative that that was the route that I took. But I, I have played for a lot of churches and a lot of different kind of settings and scenarios. And it gets really difficult when you walk in to play for a church band and there's some volunteers and then there's some paid players. Mm -hmm. And some people are very understanding. They want to support uh, somebody that chose to make music their career. Yeah. And then there's a vast majority of people that are like, why am I paying my tithes and offerings just so they can pay this guy who he wasn't a member of the church. He just came in to play for the church to make some money. Mm -hmm. Right. And I can understand those perspectives. Um, I get it. I've been through so many different types of, like I said, different scenarios of churches, different perspectives of people that um, either didn't care where I came in from when I started or what any of that was. They just want to do what they could to help me pursue this career of being a full-time musician. And um, I just see in that community a lot of people, because they get different players that come in and offer or even are kind of bullied into playing for free or <laughs> mm -hmm. what I've been through before, tricked into playing for free. Ooh. Yeah, I won't say where it was, uh, a, a church that you and I know, um, or at least know of, asked me to play handsome payment, really good payment. They did like multiple services on Saturday and Sunday, so there were two full days. And they set up a string of Sundays and Saturdays, a string of weekends for me to play with them, and I thought I was just filling in. And uh, after the second weekend... The third and fourth, I never got a check for. And they said, oh, well, because you have, you've played consistently for a couple of weeks, we view you now as a member of the church, and we don't pay members of our church. So those kind of things happen, too. That's so, dirty. It, yeah. I, you know, there's some great people in the church, just like everywhere else. And then there's some shady work that happens, too. I feel like a lot of our examples are going to include churches because, I mean, we're the— this part of where we live is so highly concentrated with churches. Yeah. And the vast majority of those are fantastic organizations, yep. fantastic people doing really, really good things for their community. And some aren't. Just like any other Just organization. Just like everything else. Yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, even from a recording standpoint, I had one lady, the ultimate Karen that I have ever recorded here was... I don't know what the word is, not a deacon or an elder, but she was like some high She level. had a title in She the had church. a title in this church, and they were they were doing their record. Um, it got to the end of it. Uh, I don't know if she didn't realize. I mean, she definitely realized I have security cameras here. But <laughs> she got upset and threw something, um, and one of the lights in the hallway fell mm -hmm. on her. <laughs> It was all on camera. And so she wanted to, she wasn't getting like the price. She wanted to renegotiate the price at the last minute of this thing, thinking that like this should be my offering. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's, that's not her decision to make, right. frankly. Um, you know, what I do with around the churches is no one's business, especially, especially when I hardly know you. Yeah. And we've already agreed on a price. There's invoices, there's all this stuff. But then, to throw a fit to the point where she she injured herself mm -hmm. and and vandalized your property. Yes, and it was on camera. <laughs> uh, I never saw them again. <laughs> I could imagine. Uh, record never got finished. Uh, but yeah, that was my fun story. Yeah, where again, it's just a it's a a fundamental like where money becomes such a negative focus of it. And like Does. we were making good art up to that point, frankly. Mm -hmm. And like it was a project that I was I was into. I was having a great time. And so were they. The mo the people who were involved were having a good time. Like it was this one piece of it where money that had frankly already been agreed upon, already been decided upon. Everybody knew the stipulations. Everybody knew what was going on. But we wanted to change the rules at the last second. 
And it just became this big thing in the room and led to somebody's yeah. temper tantrum. Like, <laughs> I, I think if we take it to the secular world for a second here, um, I know that this is maybe a little bit off of the beaten path because we're talking about not-for-profit businesses and their effect on the local scene. But like you said, bands are businesses too. Artists are also businesses. We have to make money. That's our our job is to create art and to express ourselves that way. But you can't make it a job unless you're making money, right? Mm -hmm. So I've had this conversation with a lot of my friends uh, in the industry locally for Indianapolis. And if you're around here, you know that we have a good scene, but we are also kind of hurting a little bit. It's, it's, hmm. it's a cover band scene mostly. And there's okay. a lot of insanely talented, really, really good independent artists that we have a few hubs that we can go perform. But most of the money making opportunities in Indianapolis are revolving around cover bands, mm -hmm. which is still great. You can still make a living playing music. It might not be your own music or a majority of it might not be, but you still have an opportunity. That's why I say it's a good scene. There's a lot happening. There's a lot of people investing themselves into the scene to keep growing it. But the conversation that I have with a lot of my friends um, is along the lines of the venues that do support local music, there are a few of them and it feels like we're sitting on the fence about what direction we're going to be going. But it feels like a few of them are getting very accustomed to Oh, no, we're giving you this opportunity to play your music. Mm. So um, the exposure, I, the exposure, you can sell your merch here. That's fine. But like we're not going to we're not, there's not going to be a, a payment or at best, maybe you get a percentage of drink sales or something, you know. And then on the other side of that conversation, you have the audience that has grown very accustomed to going to a restaurant or a bar and. There's a band playing, but they didn't have to pay a cover. Yeah. And so you have this problem growing on both sides of the audience and the establishments getting accustomed to these bands almost acting as not-for-profit as well mm -hmm. in, a, in a little bit different way than like what you were talking yeah. about. But Not necessarily not-for-profit, but profit was not the focus. Yes, yeah. I think that, that definitely came from like the... I feel I felt that big in the early 2000s where like you could make money in like a lot of aspects as a band but the venues that were the shows that were big at that point at least around here were like rock and heavier shows yeah. and those venues weren't necessarily charging back then merch sales were such a large part mm -hmm. of of what you were actually doing and you could still make a lot of money like selling your music frankly it wasn't that hard to move 20 or 30 CDs. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds so old. <laughs> but I remember those days clearly, mm -hmm. you know, young kids. <laughs> yeah, young bucks. Um, and so it wasn't that big of a deal to not get a portion of the door if there was a door at all. Right. Because uh, then you knew the venue was staying healthy. They were doing what they needed to do because – a lot of these venues, this was also in the days of like coffee shops yeah. <laughs> having shows. So like they weren't selling alcohol. They were selling coffee, which is also a massive markup. But still, I, but I, as we all got older, we didn't really shift that dynamic. And then merch gets harder and harder to sell. Yeah, Music is harder and harder to sell. Nobody has a CD player anymore. So we're not selling those. <laughs> yeah. And, but we never really looked back at the venue and went, hey. You need to do something different too. Yeah. Um, but this is interesting. That's like that's a part of it that I hadn't thought about because I'm also not in that scene like I was mm -hmm. before, but you are. Yeah. That's a really interesting insight into and it. It's not, I don't know. I'm not trying to make it sound doom and gloom. Like I say, there's a lot of people trying to fix that. There's a lot of um like starter venues that have people with a lot of friends or come from the music industry themselves that went through that. And so they're striving as hard as they can to change it. Hmm. So it's not doom and gloom. I do. I worry about um, the audience. We've talked about this before about how kind of post pandemic, it seems as though the audience mentality has shifted a little bit 
And I, I still hope that we stop seeing so many people walk up to the door of an establishment, be asked to pay a cover, and then turn around and leave mm-hmm. because they don't want to spend five dollars to walk in because somebody's playing, you know. And that's the kind of thing that I don't know. It blows my mind. You're going to pay fourteen dollars for a drink. You won't pay five dollars just because there's this independent group that's trying to earn a little bit of money playing at the venue. Mm-hmm. I don't know. No, I don't know. Pay the five dollars. Just go in, help somebody <laughs> out. But it's and at that point, is it the venue's fault? And that's what I'm saying. I I don't think that itself is the venue's fault. Venues. So well, let's let's back up here. Yeah. So if the whole if the whole thing here needs to be sustainable, how could this change, or what would force a mentality change? Because if if you have a band who's hustling, and I think I mean we've been on that side. Probably a lot of you have been on this mm-hmm. side, or at least you can appreciate this side of things. Like a band isn't just showing up and playing music, right? There's a whole lot. Before there's, I mean, you're putting in a long day to play a show, not even to account for all the rehearsal that went up into that. If you're looking at this from a career standpoint, and I, and I understand there are people doing this for hobbies Mm -hmm. and that's completely valid. But if we are looking at this as a sustainable thing, maybe not the doctor who is out there with his cover band doing this for fun. Yeah. But the individuals who are doing this as a, maybe not a career, but a money-making venture mm-hmm. that at least sustains itself. Yeah. So the band has that mentality. They know they need to make X amount of dollars per show, whether that comes from merch, door, drinks, whatever. Yep. The venue has something that they're gaining from this. They're using either the band as a marketing tool, even if they didn't market that, hey, X band is going to be playing on X day, but they're known for providing live music. Is that then something that they're benefiting from either in food sales, drink sales, door, whatever? They should be paying for that. And I don't know how to make that disconnect make sense. Because what I've seen a whole lot of times, and I've been a part of it, it's like a big slap in the face. Because if you pay attention to a venue, and, there, and there's one awfully close to here, um, where we were gonna, we were playing for a portion of door and drinks. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw hundreds of drinks get sold, mm-hmm. hundreds. In this place, you you're really hard to find a drink under seven dollars. Yeah. At this place, I understand I'm not gonna get seven dollars for every drink. Right or even the full amount of the door. But we left with nothing that day. Nothing. Ooh. And Ooh. that place that place was packed. Yeah. And their drinks were flowing. Um, we did get a couple free drinks for the show. We played for like four hours. Um, and it was a great show. And at the end of it, we got nothing, despite having a contract, which I always recommend everybody do. But, I mean, are you... If something happens, you have to still be willing to pursue it. And in that instance, who was in charge of the band just wasn't willing to pursue it. So that's their decision to make. But <laughs> that the venue made money because there was a band there playing. Yeah. And there was the band either brought people in or kept those people in that establishment so that they bought another drink yep. or an appetizer or whatever. Probably both of those things because I know we brought a hefty amount of indiv- individuals there and those people bought food and drinks. And we got nothing for it. <laughs> like, so what's the answer, right? I don't. Yeah, that's that's the hard part. What What is keeping the venue because it is such a there, – there's no recourse. Like there's not like – we're not in Nashville, where yeah. if you get a bad reputation, nobody's going to show. Yeah, there is such a balance of people who will play for free. So, what so, does the venue care? This is all true. I think the the best form of the answer is every party realizing that an investment needs to be made. Mm-hmm. I don't foresee that easily happening, or 
everybody willingly adopting that because nobody wants to spend money to make money. Mm-hmm. They're going to look for the path where how do we spend the least amount of money to make money? And it's not always spending money that is the answer. But in this scenario, I think at least for a lot of it, it is. So um, my real perspective on this it might make some people mad. Might be a hot okay. take. Might be a hot take. Okay, let's go. So <laughs> you made the distinction earlier that we are talking about groups that maybe you're not trying to make a career out of this, but you are trying to make a living off mm-hmm. of playing or at least a large chunk of your living off of playing. What I'm saying is not in regards to the hobbyist people, the people starting the the doctors with the cover bands and want to go out and jam with their friends, right? This yep. doesn't pertain to you. This pertains to the people trying to make it. Um, I think one, the band needs to invest in themselves. The artists need to invest in themselves. You have to keep trying to get better. No matter what genre it is, no matter what you play, you can be playing for 20 plus years. You think you're great. Keep trying to get better. Um, The part that I think is going to make people mad is that I think a large part of the problem is you have these venues that are letting any band come in that will be willing to play for free or for cheap or for a small percentage of the door or whatever. And because of that, you're getting a lot of bad bands. You're getting a lot of bands that aren't um, either experienced, that don't care enough to try to be better, Mm -hmm. that haven't put in the time to educate themselves on more than just how to play their own songs, but how to do their best to sound good in whatever venue they're in. Mm -hmm. And when you are just a person trying to enjoy your Friday night, get a few drinks and maybe hear some music, you're not going to stay at the place that doesn't have a good band. (laughs) <laughs> you're going to leave. Mm-hmm. You're also doing this weekend after weekend. You're going to stop going to the places that have the original bands. You're going to start going to the places that have an experienced cover band that sounds good. You recognize the music. You're going to enjoy yourself more. And I genuinely think that's a big problem that's happening in a lot of local music. And I'm not sending hate to the people out there. I'm not saying that everybody sucks at music or anything. But I think it's a hard truth that people need to understand. I try to get better all the time because Mm -hmm. I realize, one, there's no upper limit to how good you can be. Yeah. And two, I just have that trait. I'm never satisfied because I know that I can keep getting better. Mm -hmm. And not everybody needs to adopt that. But I just, I don't know. There's not an easy way or a really nice way of saying there are groups that aren't trying to sound as good as they could that are ruining the experience for the people that are putting in the time and the effort. That Yeah. I, from the opposite side of this, you brought back a, a horrible memory that I think I've suppressed. <laughs> Me and the wife found ourselves on a date night, mm-hmm. uh, which didn't happen a whole lot. We have, we have young kids. And it happened to be on a Friday. Mm-hmm. That never happens. That was. I think we got to sleep over one of the grandparents, and so we're like, "Yes, let's go out and get some dinner." It happened to be at a venue. Uh, well, it was a restaurant slash bar that has a venue. Mm-hmm. There was no cover at the door. Mm-hmm. That's fine. I also didn't know anyone was playing. So, <laughs> to your point in getting better, um, the the band was so bad playing and i really don't want this to come off like i'm I'm an elitist or anything right i can appreciate a lot Uh, and i mean on the other hand this sounds really harsh i can tolerate a lot yep same (laughs) (laughs) this was i I mean artistic maybe (laughs) it was not um it was just it was bad i don't know how else to say it there they were playing covers, but you would have to really dig to try to figure out what that cover was. Everything was off key. Guitars were out of tune. Mm-hmm. They brought their own PA that was constantly feeding back. We got a drink and we were going to order food, appetite. We left. Like, yeah. we did not stick around very long. And we remember that and we haven't gone back to that place. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and it's, I don't know if that's been like a conscious decision that you two made together or if it's just subconsciously like you had a bad time you don't want to go back to a place where you had a bad time well what what could have been different in that place like okay i know they weren't paying that band 
Because they had a tip jar out. There was mm-hmm. nothing in that tip jar. And the, the way the restaurant was kind of laid out, the, the bar was in the front and the venue was kind of in the back, although you could see all the way to the back. Yeah. There was no one back there watching the band. They had all migrated up. They brought their stuff to the front. They came as far away from the band We were the trying to could. get away from the band. Yeah. So if the venue... Let's think about this. The, the the sale they lost with just me and my wife was potentially seventy five dollars. Yep. Food, apps, a second round of drinks, seventy five easy. Mm-hmm. How much other was in that room at that moment that they lost? Yep. Not to mention the fact that we didn't go back. So if they had paid a band three hundred dollars, mm-hmm. four hundred dollars, they would have made that up in food sales yep. right there, and you would have had a band who would have entertained us and brought us back. Yeah. But, okay, now here's the other, <laughs> going back to, you mentioned knowing your worth on the band side, that works in both directions. That doesn't just mean charge people more because you have more worth because you put in more time and effort. It also means every band has a phase where you should be going out and maybe not playing for exposure, but not expecting $1,200 because you're a four feet, four piece band. Right. Mm. So that venue could have just paid that band that was there already the three or $400 that wouldn't have changed anything. It would have burned the venue a little bit to maybe think about who are we going to hire? Let's kind That's of a good parse point. out. That's a good point. Let's parse out these bands a little more. And this gets me back to how do we fix it? What is the solution? So I mentioned the band side of things and like Jeremy said, I can't state it enough. I love a lot of different music, almost everything. I do my best, if I if I even have to try, to find something that I like about it. Mm-hmm. My point is not in uh, hating on people that have only been playing music for a year or yeah, whatever. Yeah, for sure. The idea is, I, I don't know, man, push yourself. Like, try to get a little bit better and realize that that can always happen. So that's my yeah. point there. The venue side, if you don't invest in a PA, if you don't invest in having somebody on staff that knows how to run sound, and if you don't invest in somebody that will take the time to book for the venue properly, Mm -hmm. if you don't have at least two of those things, you're going to have a bad time as a venue. Yeah. Like, you need to have... If you're expecting the band to bring in their own equipment, you could get very lucky and have a band that's prepared for that and has been doing that and is really good at it. This has always confused me. Yeah, go on. (laughs) If you expect a band to bring their own PA equipment or to run their own sound, it will not work. Unless you are a very specific artistic venue Mm -hmm. that has a weird quirk about it. Um, Ooh, I meant to say this too. We do need places for the people that are still green to come in and play. Of course. Like, you have to grow somehow. I'm not trying to be elitist. I'm not trying to gatekeep venues from people or live experiences from bands. We need those places, too. So, anyway, if you're trying to run a venue that's trying to make money from being a venue, have your own equipment. And better yet, have your own sound guy. Mm -hmm. But Yeah, and requiring, like, especially the larger places, because there were handful of places back when I was playing that like they're known for music Mm -hmm. but it was it was almost understood like you're gonna bring your own stuff and you're gonna run your own sound and looking back at it it's bonkers to me bonkers like if that's your if that's a thing that you're known for as a venue and that's you know you're gonna be making money off of it even though I was a young kid and I just wanted the opportunity to play and sell some CDs Mm -hmm. which at the time I was happy to do it was a different world but I mean, and thankfully, we we put in the work, and it sounded, at least I hope it was decent, but <laughs> looking back, it may not have been. But if, if that's what you're known for as a venue, and you're putting that amount of risk in a night, I mean, people will accept a whole lot of things. Yeah, They will not accept bad sound for very long. You could be the best band in the world, and if it doesn't sound good, people are going to think you suck. Yep. And not only that, like, it's kind of a safety thing. Like, I mean, you can, you can injure individuals mm-hmm. like with sound <laughs> easily, really. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, we've all been in shows where you've had feedback that was annoying, but I mean, you put a, the a mismatched system 
in, in a venue that it's really not made for and then have that same feedback issue, you could hurt some people. Yeah. Easily, yeah. not to mention just putting them off and they don't want to come back anymore. Like that amount of risk there is kind of blows my mind. Um, when you could have a one time financial investment, it doesn't even have to be a state, state of the art setup. No, heavens no. But a one time investment to guarantee that you are at least capable of having really good sound or yeah. acceptable sound in that venue. And even to the to that point where the, the venue is at least has some amount of knowledge as to what comes into all of this, then the decisions that they're making on the talent that they're bringing in are all of a sudden a little different. Like, well, do we want this band who's known for like damaging things or they, you know, they don't, they don't take like this general safety of things around them very seriously. Do we really want them here? Have they even done the research to find that out? Yeah. <laughs> I think I think a good point that um, I I kind of thought of when you were saying that is if everybody has a little bit more skin in the game, it's going to elevate everybody else. For so sure. for the venue, yeah. If you invest that money in a system, then now all of a sudden you're thinking a little bit more uh, clearly about who you want to accept as a band to be mm-hmm. on the bill and to come in. Uh, on the the other side, on the band side, if you go and play for a venue where you know it's going to sound bad, you don't care if you are very tight. No one's going to be able to tell. If you yeah. go into a venue that has great sound and a sound guy that knows what they're doing, you every individual person in your band hopefully will realize that everyone in that audience is going to be able to hear mm-hmm. exactly where I screw up. And so now on the band side, because you have a venue that cares more, you now are put in a position where at least if you're self-aware, then you're going to care more about your own sound. Mm -hmm. That's a whole other topic and problem, you know, if you're self-aware or not. But So you may be saying, well, Jeremy, Josh, you guys are just capitalists and it's all about money, whatever. There's... I don't know what I am on that spectrum, if I'm being completely honest. But there's definitely something to when you when you keep finances, at least from a like a stability standpoint and a health standpoint, and in at least in a portion of your forethought in whatever business decisions or band decisions or all these things, it makes everything else put through that filter to where the professionalism is elevated. Yeah. And we've seen this on hyper extremes in our local area. There's a bar he- around here that did invest in a system. Yep. And they did invest in somebody there to run and look at how re- their reputation has changed. Mm-hmm. And good music now just kind of flocks to that one. Yeah. And place. people are excited to go play there. And there's another venue not so far away that is very notorious for having the worst sound in the Midwest. (laughs) 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 I'm in some bad spots, Jeremy. (laughs) (laughs) I'll get pictures like (laughs) from one of our friends. Uh, He's like, oh, playing here again. (laughs) Like, like, who cares about the setup? Because you're not going to hear it anyway. Yeah. But yeah. And again, those spots need to exist in some way i think i i you can't expect somebody to just have a group and automatically be prepared to play of course at the nice places and i i get that and it goes back to to knowing your worth on both both sides so if you have put in time and you've had a few of those bigger shows or you're starting to get more of a draw or you even this is a conversation that people don't like to talk about either, but if you want to portray success mm-hmm. to help get success, the fake it till you make it approach, stop booking at those places that you know are not going to be good. Yeah. And you might lose, maybe maybe they even pay some uh, amount of money. You might lose on that amount of money. But in the long term, for most cases, if you are prepared and you've put in the work and you really are assessing your own worth uh, accurately, it's going to be more beneficial for you to play less shows, but play better shows, mm-hmm. better venues. Um, and it's going to keep you from burning out as a band. Like that was yeah. a big part of why 
I stopped playing a long time ago. It was just because I was willing to take just about every show and then got tired of it. Yeah. And eventually I didn't care. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know, I know that feeling pretty well too in <laughs> multiple different places. But so we, I think I incidentally derailed your main thought a little bit about the, the not-for-profit business side of things. It wasn't necessarily like, I didn't want it to be centered around not-for-profit, but the mentality of how people view not-for-profit and how people market being a not-for-profit. Yeah. That I think is highly misunderstood. Just because they're a not-for-profit does not mean they're not thinking about profit. They absolutely are. Yeah. And they still have to make a profit. It's just how that profit is categorized from a tax perspective. Because mm-hmm. they at the end of the day, that all the money has to be accounted for. Yeah, you can't have extra over. So, dump it into salaries. If you can, tell me how. If you can't have <laughs> extra money left over, just let me know. And obviously, this is different in whatever region you're living in. Right? Yeah. So, uh, and that's a fair fair assessment for all the stuff we're talking about. Like this is, my points are valid for my local scene. Your local scene may be entirely different. We're in the Midwest. Um, it could be completely different down south. Um, I'm sure it's drastically different on the West Coast, for example. But I think a lot of the same principles still apply of um, obviously not-for-profit stuff is, you know, how how it operates is going to be fairly similar across mm-hmm. the board. Maybe different tax breaks and different regulations from state to state. But in terms of how venues can improve, how bands can improve, how the audience can improve. Everybody is probably at different levels depending on your locale, but that doesn't mean it's perfect, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody can keep keep getting better. Um, so if you're not a player, maybe take some time to go try a venue where you do have to pay a cover fee for uh, an independent local group you've never heard of. Give it a try. Give it a try. You might be happily surprised. You might walk in and realize the venue's not great. So that's unfortunate, but at least you you tried it out a little bit. And if you have any kind of friends that, that work for a venue or you yourself work for a venue, maybe have that discussion. How can we make this a better experience for both the artists and for the uh, audience? Because it's going to improve the business. And all this comes from the perspective of like I genuinely think like I hear a lot like either bands are complaining like you can't get out of that local band stigma or uh, people in and around my scene are like well there's just no music scene here like there's just no good bands Mm -hmm. I think if you were to genuinely take a step back whether that's in our area or anywhere where you hear that if you take a step back I, I guarantee your scene is much more healthy than you think it is. Yep. And there are individuals out there playing to a level that is much higher than you see. But we have, I guess, societally devalued music to a point where we're not willing to go look for it anymore. Yep. And that's really sad because it's scaring away the people who are really good at this. And maybe you're your view on this is a little skewed because you are seeing the people who are doing this as a hobby and that's absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. They should be out there. They should have that fun. And, but if we're looking at it through that lens, maybe if you feel that way, put just even the slightest investment back into your local scene, go pay 10 bucks for a cover, go to a bar, have a drink, buy some merch, see what that does. I guarantee it'll affect it a lot quicker and a lot more drastically than you probably realize. Yep. Well, Have we fixed the world yet? Man, <laughs> I sure hope so. That was a deep one. That, yeah, that was. I'm sorry if I upset you. That's not my intention. I'm I just not. want I want things to get. <laughs> you say I'm not. <laughs> just want things to be better. I want people to keep enjoying what they're doing and be able to make a living off of it. And money's weird to talk about. It's, it's always weird. weird. It's going to piss some people off. I know some people are going to disagree, and that's that's fine. But I think you can you can look at money and you can be greedy, and it can just be about the money. But I think if you if you 
really want to be the best impact on your local area and bands around you, you have to be sustainable first. Yeah. And then they can also be sustainable. So view it through that lens, not how much money can I make? I hope it didn't come across like that. I don't think it did. I don't think so. What do you think? Let us know what you think. <laughs> what should they drop in the comments? Hmm. Money bags? Money I don't bags. know. <laughs> that makes That's sense. That's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> makes sense. Get it? Ah. Money, money pun. What have you been listening to, Jeremy? Four Years Strong has a new song, Daddy of Mine. I like that album art. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's pretty weird. But here, listen to this real quick. Cool chord changes, right? Very cool. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that's cool it's a cool vibe i know you probably have to cut some of that out um because we don't want to get flagged but i don't know a whole lot about that band uh, was, most of my recs go it just came up as a recommendation which by the way youtube music is killing it youtube music has been on point lately the algorithm man okay but this is produced mixed and i think mastered by will putney and okay that dude is just He's insane. He can make some of the most aggressive records, and they just sound smooth. Like, I have a man crush on this guy, and Aww. this is... I'm a little jealous, but aw. This is a perfect example <laughs> of, like, a great-sounding, heavy... I don't even know what to really call that. It's, like, kind of pop-punky, metal, yeah, it, thrashy. intro made me feel Metallica, yeah. and then it came in exactly like a pop-punky kind of it, the payoff, energy. The payoff was good. But then, yeah, at that part right where you stopped almost felt uber-modern. Mm -hmm. Maybe not tonally, but writing style yeah. felt... I don't know. I like that a lot. So, cool. Four Years Strong, Daddy of Mine, go check it out. Really world it weird album art yeah i like it all right my rec uh is this artist spilly cave um apparently has a good amount of popularity i actually had a student show me this artist um i haven't, I haven't heard of it i hadn't heard of spilly cave either and if i wait how much how many plays of oh, 42k 40 42.9k monthly listeners okay so this is a song I've listened to. I've only listened to one song. Also a new random artist for me. My understanding is he does everything himself. Mm. So it's like hyper jazz vibes, really tight uh, melodic runs, very cool textural layers, and then Thundercat styled vocals. And Ooh, that's... That's tasty. The tones of everything are so good. The bass tone, which is always like the first thing that I hear, mm. is just like, how's that bass sound? So nice. Buttery, a little bit of uh, just bite to it, a little bit of that aggression. And then sound choice for like these synth parts are like wacky, but not in a ironic way. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, like I said... The only thing I could equate it to vocally is Thundercat. That's the first thing that came to mind, and that's all I hear now is like those Thundercat styled vocals, which is just like very legato esque, but kind of picking the interesting intervals through these weird chord changes. Um, but that was Cario or Cario. I'm not sure how to pronounce the the name of the song, but by Spilly Cave. So I really like that, and I think. You, you got to stick around for the next one, because if you like that, you're going to love my next one. <laughs> like, so stick around. <laughs> drop the money bags. Uh, let us know your opinions on either like the, the not-for-profit mentality. How do we fix the local music say, scene if your experience is anywhere similar to what we were talking about? And all this is coming from love. We don't want to hate on anybody. Yep. Just as many negative things as we said, there's people on the positive ends of this, too. So... Nothing but love. Nothing but love. Is that how you make a heart? I don't know. These are new ones that my students taught me. Because they're little hearts. I don't know. Kids things that they do. Get out of here. Bye. <laughs>